This chapter is about data management. When we solve problems, often we use tables. Now, in general, when we solve problems, we need to figure out what we're given, what's required. We need to make a plan, i.e., figure out what we're going to do, actually do it, check if we got things correct, or at least came within shouting distance, i.e., looks pretty reasonable to me, such as, oh, um, Actually, no, uh, eating watermelons is a bad example because in math class you can eat like 100 watermelons in a meal. Uh, let's say you're trying to find the surface area of something and your conclusion was 500 milliliters. Wait a second. No, the units aren't right. Obviously, you did something very wrong. <coughs> so, let's try some examples of table making. Well, we're going to be doing some tallying. So August decided to classify 20 rocks and minerals in his collection on their hardness using the Mohs scale. After doing various tests, he recorded the hardness values of each rock or mineral in his collection in a list. So, you can do your tallying horizontally or vertically. This is tally. Now, if you're doing this like this, uh, in two rows, you're going to end up having to go downward if you need additional tallying space. If you did two columns, you could go sideways. So two, three to four, five to six. Seven to eight, nine to ten. So one to two, well, the first two are all here. Five, tally it. Three and three, so two threes. A ten, huh, that's interesting because naturally speaking, the most common mineral that you'd encounter that rates a ten or the typical mineral that you'd encounter that rates a 10 is a diamond. So he has a diamond in his connection, collection. How interesting. Uh, a 9, that's probably some variant of corundum. So a 4, 7, 6, 3, and 4, so two of them. 2, 3, and 3. One, five, and six, and three. Okay, so the most common interval of rock hardness we can clearly see from the tallies is most common hardness. is 3 to 4. This is a word problem, so we're supposed to give a statement. I restate part of the question, but answer it. Exercises. Make a table to solve each problem. Okay, this uh, list shows the amount of cash requested at an ATM in one day by each customer. So what is the common amount of money requested. The most common is, hmm, well, we got to do a tally first. Dollars and tally. Okay, what should the numbers be on this side? Well, there's a 20. We can see that there are 20s. There are 40s. There are 60s. There's no 80s, but there's 100s and 200s. 20, 40, 60, 100, 200. So, $20, 1, 60, 1, 200, 1, 100, 40, 100, 20, 60, 60, 60 again, 20, 200, 60 again, 40, 
60 and 60, 20, 100, 60, 20, oh. and then we have 60 again. So pretty obviously, the most common amount of money requested was $60. most requested. Uh, why might this be? Actually, I know exactly why. Depending on the bank and the ATM in question, there may be a $60 quick cash option on the uh, interface, which means And if you needed $80, you'd probably just go in and press the 100 instead of manually entering 8-0. Yeah. Alright, let's say we have some coffee that's being purchased. This list shows the coffee sizes purchased in one hour at a local coffee house. What is the most commonly purchased size of coffee? Well, we have small, medium, large, extra large. Uh, do we have extra smalls? No. Okay. Size. And tally. So we have small, medium, large, and extra large. Okay, yeah, actually we could have abbreviated all of these, but uh, whatever. So, tally, small, one, large and large, okay, two, large, medium, one, large, one, extra large, one, small, one, medium and medium, so two mediums, extra large, medium, Large and large, so two larges. Small, large, extra large. Medium, small, large and large. Oh, apparently, large is most purchased. Yeah, I put quote marks around large because otherwise this could read pretty awkwardly. Large is most purchased. So histograms. Data from a frequency table can be shown as a histogram. A histogram is a type of bar graph. It's used to show numerical data. Specifically, it's used to show continuous data. Because, guys, if you need to do a graph of the outcomes of a die row, like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, you would have separate bars because these rows uh, are not directly adjacent to each other. It's not like, say, a list of people's heights in your class where, oh, right at the end of one height, the next height chunk the next height bin, we call this a bin in histograms, begins. So like 140 to 150 centimeters, and then right at 150 centimeters, the next one begins. Whereas this is one, two, these are discrete outcomes. Whereas a histogram is for a continuous outcome, like people's heights or weights. So, numerical data that has been organized into equal intervals this is important. A histogram always uses intervals, not specific outcomes. That, well, these inter equal intervals are called bins, so we should probably write that down. Bins. You draw and label a horizontal and a vertical axis, and you include a title. You show the intervals from the frequency table on the horizontal axis. And for each interval on the horizontal axis, you draw a bar whose height is given by the frequencies, just like with a bar graph. 
Please note that sometimes we do histograms, but actually the data is not that continuous. We just approximate it as continuous. Like for example, let's say you rounded people's heights to the nearest centimeter, all right? And then you uh, go, oh, 140 to 149 centimeters, 150 to 159 centimeters. Considering you're rounded, technically that's actually continuous. Like, those data bins just come right up against each other, don't they? Yes, but the actual numbers you had? No. In this case, the actual numbers that you have for your bins and the actual data are not continuous. It's just 0 to 9, 10 to 19, we consider them to be effectively continuous. So, if we had to draw a histogram for this data, we, the tally, the 5, 2 means that we tallied a set of 5 like this, and then we had two more. It's just, this is a way of representing the tally. If we had to do this, we would have these bins laid out in equally so width bars along the bottom, along the horizontal axis, and then we would have the number of teams on the vertical axis. And this would be the frequency of each bin. That decides the height of each bar. Exercises. Suppose a frequency table shows the number of mice eliminated by various styles of trap. Anybody who thinks that mouse traps are not good things has obviously never actually had a mouse infestation where they lived. Anyway, these styles include snap traps, choking traps, Sticky traps, which by the way are the cruelest type of trap because the mouse will chew through its legs to try and get free and then it just gets stuck again and it slowly dies of exposure. At least a snap trap has a decency to just smash its neck or head in and that's that. So it doesn't suffer for that long. Choking traps, they choke it to death very quickly compared to a sticky trap where they end up starving or getting eaten by something else while they're still alive <clears throat> or die of thirst or something. Live capture, cage, or box traps. Live captures are a luxury when you're dealing with mice. Because like, what are you going to do? You have a hundred mice in your barn and you're going to drive out after capturing each of them? And like release them a hundred miles from your house just to uh, bother somebody else. And besides, how far are you driving exactly? Uh, your time has value, you know. Rolling log traps. These actually work remarkably well if you can set the sensitivity of the rolling log, of the roller, <coughs> uh, correctly. It can be called a rolling log. It can just be called a roller. Uh, walk the plank traps and so on. Now would this frequency table be suitable for a histogram? Are these bins continuous? Do they blend into each other on a continuous gradient? No, I mean sure there are hybrid style traps but overall no. So, uh, <laughs> no. These are discrete items, like red cars, blue cars. Suppose a frequency table shows a number of red, blue, green, yellow, etc. cars that pass by an intersection in an hour. Would this be suitable for a histogram? Oh, we just said so. Uh, no. We just used this example. Okay. Suppose a frequency table shows a number of cars that pass by an intersection in an hour based on their peak reflected wavelength of visible light. So, 
this doesn't actually mean color because let's say a car that looks crimson so bright red is peak reflection is a certain wavelength of red light okay now let's say we have a car that's magenta or some shade of purple but its red reflection just happens to be a bit more than its blue reflection note that this car can actually look pretty blue because a human eye is pretty sensitive to blue light uh, okay well actually people's eyes vary in sensitivity so we all see colors slightly differently so yeah you can be like these two cars are clearly different colors but they could have the same peak reflected wavelength but the peak reflected wavelength falls on the electromagnetic spectrum which includes visible light as part of the spectrum so that is continuous this is continuous information and it's in a frequency table it is suitable for a histogram yes other than the binning step and the fact that you have to draw your bars actually touching each other a histogram is just like a bar graph all right let's say we have circle graphs uh, let's make a circle graph using the information in the table due to the artistic limitations of my equipment I pre-drew this for us so batting in major league baseball you have handedness and the percent of batters how do you make your circle graph well also known as a pie chart it's used to represent data that compares parts of the set to the whole thing and to each other so that you can immediately see what proportion it occupies uh, how do you make this well you use angles 62% that's 0.62 times 360 degrees or 223.2 degrees and then you measure out to 23.2 degrees and that's it this is right handed this is left handed and this is other okay we'll just label that for the graph purposes and you should point out that if you actually change the uh, title of a category if you change the name of a category you have to point it out so 26% uh, that's 0.26 times 360 oh, that's 93.6 degrees and 12% times 360 is 43.2 degrees well then let's make some circle graphs yeah I pre-made these two so in a survey about lethal mousetrap preferences 70% of people said they like snap traps 12% said they like sticky traps yes. how inhumane compared to snap traps or 10% uh, of people said they like choking traps and 8% of people said they liked other types of traps I got a question guys where's a set of people who said they liked their pet cats because that is a type of lethal mouth trap or their pet terriers actually because terriers uh, are actually pretty good at killing rats hmm maybe that's why it's not here because mice are rather smaller than that and oh well maybe you can train a chihuahua to kill mice <coughs> anyway 70% uh, said they like snap traps so you would take the 70% and you would convert this to an angle so 0 0.7 times 360 is 252 degrees 
You would plot it out and you would repeat this for all the others. So once you do that, you label your thing, snap traps, and this is sticky. 10% says they like choking traps. Note that I abbreviated it slightly. And then the rest were other. When handling dead rodents, be very careful uh, and ensure that you have gloves on. In addition, don't vacuum up rodent poop or urine because that could spread hantavirus. You should rinse it away or apply some water and then scoop that water away. Eventually it comes down to dry cleaning but the point is you should probably bleach the surface before dry cleaning to destroy hantavirus. 12% of your classmates had all four food groups in their breakfast. 25% had three food groups, 35% had two food groups, 10% had one food group, and 18% did not have breakfast. Okay. How would you calculate this? You would go 0.12 times 360 degrees, 43.2 degrees. You plot that out for groups. 25% has three food groups. You would, of course, wait a second. You don't need a calculator for this, 0.25. So one quarter of 360 degrees, that's 90 degrees. This is three groups. So yeah, you calculate the angles and then you plot them. Of course, a table is recommended. You'd be like four, three, two, one, and zero. This is food groups, and this would be percent, so you'd be like, yeah, I'm just going to write this out for y'all's all, benefit. 12%, 25%, 35%, and then 10%, and 18%, and then you'd be like, angle. And do what I just said. After that, you plot these out using a protractor, and that's that. This is one group, and this is no breakfast. Central tendency and range. The most common measures of central tendency are mean, median, and mode. To find the mean of a data set, find the sum of the data values and then divide by the number of items in the set. To find the median of a data set, you put them in order from least to greatest, or greatest to least for that matter, because when you're looking for the median, it doesn't matter. And then you find the middle number. If there are two middle numbers, you add them together and divide by two. In other words, if there are an even number of items in the data set. The mode of a data set is the number or numbers that occur most often. If no number occurs more than once, the data set has no mode. The range is also used to describe a set of data. It's the difference between the greatest and the least number in a set of data. So the amount of space on the number line that the uh, data set spans. Find the mean, median, mode, and range of the set of data. Round to the nearest tenth if necessary. The age in years of relatives staying at your home are listed below. So you got two, five, eight, ten, fourteen, 33, 
35, 41, 42, 62, 65, 79. So, you got 7 plus 5, which is 12 items. So, the median would be... Thirty-four. The mean equals two plus five plus eight plus ten plus fourteen plus thirty-three plus thirty-five plus forty-one plus forty-two. So after you add these up and divide by the total number of items of data points, you end up with the average is 33, or the mean is 33. Okay, what's the mode? So the most common number. Well, we see that all the numbers are only present once. What we call this is there is no mode. On the other hand, if you had say, one, one, two, two, three, three, four, four, five, well, all the numbers except 5 are present twice, but 5 is present less than twice. So your modes would be 1, 2, 3, and 4. All of them would be modes, except 5. So, because there is no mode here, you can have many modes, one mode, or no modes. No modes if nothing repeats. So if there are no modes here, we say that, or if everything repeats an equal number of times. So no mode. Like one, one, two, two, three, three. There would be no mode there because everything repeated the same number of times. So there's no mode. What about the range? Oh, it's from two to 79. Range. Because 79 minus 2, which is equal to 77. Now, since this says ages in years, hmm, really we should probably have units, guys. Years. 33 years. Uh, the abbreviation for years is annum, which is A. But you also see stuff like YRS or Y. So yeah, make sure you know what you guys is used around your place. Find the mean, median, mode, and range of each data set. Round to the nearest tenth if necessary. Well, this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, that means the median must be four. The mean is also 4, because the data set is symmetrical around the median. Median equals 4. Mode, no mode. And range is equal to 7 minus 1, or 6. Okay, what about this here? Hmm, 15, 18, 24, 28, 28, 32, 39. Uh, there are seven data points, which means that number four, when you line up from least to greatest, must be the median. The median is therefore 28. The mode is also 28, because we can see 28 twice here, whereas the other numbers only show up once. Now for the mean, we add these up, 15 plus 18 plus 28 plus 28 plus 34 plus 24 
plus 32 equals 184. And we divide that by there are seven data points. So round to the nearest tenth if necessary. Well, then that means mean is approximately 26.3. Now the range is equal to the greatest number minus the least number. That means 39 minus 15, which is 24. All right, what about this next one? Well, the mean, uh, by the way, guys, when it says round to the nearest tenth if necessary, if these numbers had been to more decimal places than that, you don't round for the mode. Even if it says round to the nearest whatever, if necessary, your mode should actually be either no mode or whatever the actual data points were. This is important. The median if it lands on an actual data point, you should not round. If it lands between two data points, well, round to the nearest, whatever, if the question indicates so. Okay, mean 1.3 plus 1.8 plus 1.9 plus 2.5 plus 1.3 plus 1.4 plus 2.2 plus 1.8 plus 2.5 plus 1.3 is 18 and there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 data points. So, mean is 18 divided by 10, mean 1.8, median, well, uh, we have 1.3, 1.3, 1.3, there are 10 data points, so it's going to be the average of the 5th and 6th, so 1, 2, 3, and then 4, 5, 6, okay, the average of 1.8. 1.8 plus 1.8 divided by 2 equals, of course, still 1.8. Okay, what's the mode? We see that there are two 1.8s, but there are three 1.3s. So the mode equals 1.3. Now the range is the largest minus the smallest. And the largest here that we see is 2.5, which there are also two of. So, 2.5 minus 1.3 gives us 1.2 for the range. Now, for measures of variation, the lower quartile is also known as the first quartile. Quartile. Or... Q1. And upper quartile is also known as Q3. The median is Q2. Q1 is a median of the lower half of a set of data. And Q3 is a median of the upper half of a set of data. The interquartile range is the difference between Q3 and Q1. So Q3 minus Q1. Find the range, median, upper, and lower quartiles, and interquartile range for the following set of data. Well, we gotta write this out from smallest to largest. So it's 2, 4, 8, and then we got 10. Do we have 11? No. 12. And then we got two 13s. 13. 14, 15, 15, 16, and 21. 
6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. That means that the median has to be Z6. Counting from smallest or counting from largest. So the median. Median. And then you find the median of the lower half. Which means that this is Q1 and this is Q3. Well, as we can see, we've found them. Depending on teacher, though, you might actually have to state median equals 13, Q1 equals 8, Q3 equals 15. Anyway, for our purposes, no. Range, yeah, we, got, we should find the range first. Range equals 21 minus two, so you know what, let's just write 19 right out, right off the bat. Upper and lower quartiles and interquartile range, which is, by the way, abbreviated to IQR. IQR is equal to Q3 minus Q1 which is equal to 15 minus 8 equals 7. Now in some data sets, a few of the values for, are much greater than or less than the rest of the data, and any data that's more than one and a half times the value of the interquartile range beyond the quartiles are called outliers. <sighs> this convention may vary slightly because I've seen some places that go with three times the value of the IQR outside the quartiles makes it an outlier. Let's find any outliers for the set of data given in example one. Well, one and a half times the IQR, you know what, Q1 minus 1.5 times IQR is equal to, I believe it was 8 minus 1.5 times 7. Yeah, that's negative 2.5. And Q3 minus plus 1.5 IQR is equal to, Q3 is 15, IQR is 7. 15 plus 1.5 times 7. That's going to be 25.5. So, no data less than negative 2.5 or greater than 25.5 in set. So, there are no outliers. No. Outliers. Let's do some exercises. Find the range, median, upper, and lower quartiles, interquartile range, and any outliers for each set of data. Did you notice anything interesting? Well, what's interesting to be noticed? Oh, hey, it looks like this is just that one plus 20. All right, then. Let's write this in uh, order from least to greatest. Four, five, six, eight, nine, fourteen. So the range is equal to a fourteen minus three or eleven, and the median. Median, you can write as Q2, by the way. Q2. This is Q1. 
This is Q3. What's the interquartile range? Q3 minus Q1, so 9 minus 4, which is equal to 5. Outliers would have to be one and a half times this, so 7.5 outside of the quartiles. Uh, as we can see, there would be no outliers. Okay. What's the mean? Did, did we have to find the mean? Oh, we didn't have to find the mean. Oh, wonderful. Okay. What happens if we add 20 to everything? So, plus 20 to every data point. And then we get range still 11 equals 11 just to distinguish that from the L's uh, Q3 is plus 20 now it's gonna be 29 Q2 is also plus 20 so it's also just moved up it's 26 Q1 is 24. The interquartile range, IQR, is still 5. And there are still no outliers. The calculations for the outliers, if there had been any, would also not have changed. What happens is that we basically moved everything, including the intervals, such as the range, sideways on a number line. Now, if you move something sideways, a length, it moves sideways, doesn't change the length. But a point, if you look at the value indicated by the point, when moved sideways, well, it changes value. A box and whisker plot uh, uses the num a number line, which, by the way, depending on the question, you may or may not have a number line for reference and scaling, which means your box and whisker plots, also known as box plots, by the way, box plot, a box plot uses a number line usually to show the distribution of a set of data you draw the box around the quartile values and the whiskers extend from each quartile to the extreme data points that are not outliers so like this suppose your median is here this is your Q1 Q2 Q3 and then you draw these whiskers out to however far you need before you hit the 1.5 IQR boundary and if there are any points out here you draw them as dots same thing for the other end just put them as dots use this data set to construct a box and whisker plot okay two nine and we have three elevens Then we have a 12, 13, 15, and 17. Okay. 
Where is Q2? It's right in the middle. It's a median. This is Q2. And then Q1 equals 10. Q3 equals 14. Let me look at these four numbers. All right. We construct a box and whisker plot. What is the IQR? The interquartile range is 4. So 2 is an outlier. An outlier. Okay. If I was to sketch this box and whisker plot, it would look something like this. It's a box. Uh, we know there's no number line for reference, hence the sketching. We know that this 10 to 11, that's 1, and 11 to 14 is 3. So it's got to be around here. And we could point out the values q2 equals 11 because we kind of have to do this if there's no number line for reference q1 equals 10 and q3 equals 14 q3 equals 14 and on this end the whisker would be very short indeed uh, but then we would have an outlier at 2 which eight seven six five four three two roughly here my outlier equals two as you can see this would be a bit easier if we had a number line uh, but it can't be helped Okay, let's do some exercises. Construct a box and whisker plot for each set of data. Oh, wait a second. Is this just a plus 10 relationship or plus 20? No, unfortunately, which means we actually can't just say change the number line reference. Okay, let's write this from lowest to highest. So it's going to be 3, 4, 5, 6, 8, 9, 14, and this is Q2, Q1, Q3. So the interquartile range is 5. Okay. Are there any outliers? No. Because you'd have to go 7.5 beyond this to get an outlier. So, you're looking at an IQR of 5. And Q2 is 2 fifths of the way through. So about here. And... You could just mark down the numbers. Then you would have three and fourteen. Fourteen is five beyond that, so if this is a length of five, that's going to be pretty far. So it would look something like this. This is a sort of box and whisker plot that happens when you don't have a number line for reference, which is actually pretty common. Uh, you should use a ruler if at all possible, though. My equipment doesn't allow me, so that's too bad. Let's write this from smallest to largest. This is going to be 16, 18, all right, I don't need commas, uh, 20. 24, 
And we have 229s and 35. Okay, this is Q2, Q1 is 18, and then Q3 is 29. So 18 to 29 is 11, and there are then no outliers. So 11 with 24 being 6 through, it doesn't have to be exactly to scale, guys, if you label the actual values. Big if, I know. Anyway, uh, 16 is over here. 16. And 35 is 6 beyond, which is not particularly short. Yeah, so it's called a box and whisker plot because it looks like, well, two boxes really, uh, with whiskers. The stem and leaf plots. Stem and leaf plots are a way to organize data that is generally most convenient if you only have two digits in each data point. But, if the front end of your stem is the same, such as 103, 107, 109, 113, 115, you can have 10, 11, and so on. Uh, usually it's the greatest place value in front, but it could also be the greatest two or even several place values, depending on what you're doing. And then the next greatest place values uh, form the leaves. So you could have 107 and 111 if your other data points are going to be like 200 something, 300 something, then yeah, it's going to be 1, 2, 3. But if it's 110, 111, 112, 108, then you might have 1, 0 and 1, 1 as your stems. Display this data in a stem and leaf plot. Well, You have fives, you have sixes, you have sevens. Actually, you should write down all the stems. The manageability of the number of stems kind of determines uh, how big each of your stems are going to be, like tens, hundreds, maybe thousands, and so on. And your leaves, well, Fives, you have a 55, 50, 5, and you have a 58. For 60s, you have a 64, 64. For the 70s, you have a 70 and then a 5. Yes, I know this sounds exactly as obnoxious as you think, uh, but there is a benefit to this. What would happen if we had, say, a tally and it was like nearest tens or which group of tens? 50 to 59, 60 to 69, and so on, and we just tallied them. Well, then we wouldn't have the actual exact values recorded. We would lose some data while we were making that histogram. You can still make a histogram from a stem and leaf plot because each entry here is, in the case, one point. But, you also keep all your original information, at least the numbers. I mean, the uh, labels you kind of lose, but that can't be helped. For the 80s, you have an 80, another 80. You, depending on convention, you may or may not be required to organize your stem and leaf plot in increasing order of leaves. So I could have written 5 and then 0 and then 0 again. 
For nines, we have a 90. We have a 92. We got a 95. Now we count these up and there are 10 points. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Okay, good. We didn't do any miscounting. Wonderful. So let's display each set of these data in a stem and leaf plot. Stem, leaf. So for the tens, we have 18. For the 20s, we have 22, 24, 27, 27. For the 30s, we have 31, 33, 39, and then for the 40s, we have 4, 0. Okay, there's 8 data points and we have 8 here. Wonderful. We didn't miss anything. For STEM, leaf. Of course, you could go out crossing them out as you put them on. That works too. We have a 75. We got an 82, an 86, and an 88. And for the 90s, we got a 95, a 99, well, two 99s. And let's count up how many data points we had. Oh, we had eight. Oh, well, there was only seven here. Did, what did we miss? And then we would go back through it again. Always count up your tallies and your total to make sure that you didn't miss anything. Unless you did the crossing out while going through method, in which case it's pretty obvious when you miss something. But even then, you should still count up the total. That way... You make sure you didn't accidentally cross out two things and then only write one down. Now suppose you have the following stem and leaf plot of projectile ranges in meters from testing a slingshot with what you thought was a consistent technique. Whether this be an old-fashioned sling or a slingshot, uh, doesn't matter. But the consi supposed consistent technique produced ranges from 59 meters, right? Yeah, it's in meters. Please note that spelling of meter may vary depending on region. Uh, officially, it's supposed to be M-E-T-R-E, -E, metra, like metric. But yeah, you see this a lot too. So what's the longest range you achieved and what's the shortest? The longest range you achieved was 81 meters. And... The shortest was 59 meters. What is the median range that you achieved? Well, how many data points are there? Oh, we can see clearly on the stem and leaf plot that it's almost symmetrical, except there's one more in the sevens. Which means that the median is going to be the least of the sevens. It is 72 meters. Of course, this particular stem and leaf plot rather indicates that what you thought was a consistent technique wasn't. <laughs> like, no, it was not that good. All right, let's select an appropriate display because there are so many ways to display data. Some of these displays and their uses are shown below. A bar graph is used to show the number of items in specific categories. A histogram shows the frequency of continuous data divided into equal intervals, which are also called bins. We also call this binned data because it's been put into, well, bins. A box and whisker plot shows measures of variation for a set of data. Please note that in many places, like in a, a lot of scientific studies I've seen, I've seen graphs that have box and whisker plots that look like this. So yeah, sometimes there's no such thing as an outlier when you're doing a box and whisker plot, depending on the specific requirements of your uh, field of study. 
Circle graphs compare parts of the data to the whole, so they show the proportions occupied very well by each category. Line graphs show change over a period of time. Line plots show how many times each number occurs in the data. What's the difference between a line graph and a line plot? Well, a line plot can also be said to be a probability distribution curve. If you had your probability distributions and the outcomes were continuous, a line plot is join midpoints of histogram tops. In other words, if you have this, your line plot would be this. Yeah. That's why it's often used for probability distributions. Stem and leaf plot. You list all the individual numerical data in condensed form, so it's a bit shorter. Venn diagrams show how elements among sets of data are related. When you're deciding what type of display to use, consider the type of information and what the graph is trying to show. All data sets can be displayed in many ways, and there's often more than one appropriate way to display a given set of data, like say cars passing by an intersection divided up by color. Well then, you could use a bar graph, you could also use a pie chart or a circle graph. Pie charts are another name for circle graph. Let's do an example. Choose an appropriate type of display for each situation. The change in average speeds of winners from the final race of the Indianapolis 500 through its history. Through its history, well that's change over time. This is probably a line graph. Please note that in many places line graphs and line plots are not generally often distinguished. Energy usage in Germany, categorized by the type of user. Well, if you're looking uh, to show the numbers more than the proportions compared to each other, you want to use a bar graph. But for our purposes, this is probably going to be a circle graph, or also known as a pie chart. Exercises. Select an appropriate type of display for each situation and justify your reasoning. The cost of homeowners insurance over the last 10 years. Uh, this is a change over time. So a line graph or a line chart is probably what you're looking for. Because it's a change over time. Over time. And the amount of federally owned land in each Canadian province. How many Canadian provinces are there? There is 10. Result? You can have 10 bars pretty comfortably. Whereas if you had to do this for a, a country with rather more provinces and territories, like say perhaps China, or the United States, which has a lot of states, a bar graph would not be very practical and you might want to bin it and go with a histogram. But for Canadian provinces, bar graph. There are only 10 bars. And can show numbers well. Why can I show the numbers well? 10 bars, that means categorical data. That's why. Of course.
course, when you're stating your explanations, you should probably use a little bit uh, better grammar than this, than like arrows pointing in or stuff, <laughs> even in math class. Well then, that's it for this chapter, so see you later.